Okay, are we starting? All right. Good afternoon. This is Contacts and Continuities, 500 Years of Asian Iberian Encounters, an international conference hosted by the Ateneo de Manila University in collaboration with CHAM Centro de Humanidades, Universidad de Nova de Lisboa, and the National Quincentennial Committee of the Republic of the Philippines. It's now 4 p.m. here in Manila, and this is the final panel of this four-part month-long online conference. We are live streaming on the conference YouTube channel and the National Quincentennial Committee Facebook page. Again, good afternoon, everyone in the Zoom room and on social media. My name is Jacqueline from Kelly, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. I'm from the Department of English of the Ateneo de Manila University, and our department is very happy and honored to host today's panel on language and identity formation. So the, the building that you see here is HB de la Costa Hall that houses uh, the English department. Um, we all miss it. Uh, we hope to see it soon, but we're glad that uh, we can all gather here this afternoon. So for the next two hours, uh, we will be listening to four distinguished speakers joining us from Kuala Lumpur, Zamboanga, Helsinki, and Manila. And then after their presentations, we will have a Q&A. So um, we have community managers, Dr. Noel Rodriguez and Ms. Juvelin Nervis. Uh, they will gather your questions from Facebook, the YouTube comments section, and of course, from this Zoom room. So uh, we invite you to type in your questions and we will read them out for you later. So let's begin this 19th and final panel of contacts and continuities. Let me introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Stephanie Shamila Lai. Dr. Bilai is a professor at the Faculty of Languages and Linguistics University of Malaya or UM and currently the Dean of the Social Advancement and Happiness Research uh, Cluster at UM. Her areas of research include phonetics, varieties of English, language use in multilingual contexts, language documentation, language revitalization, and English language education. She has been working with Malacca Portuguese community representatives on language documentation and revitalization efforts. She has also co-produced a series of videos of a Malaysian folktale voiced in several Malaysian indigenous languages. Aside from her various research activities and international fellowships, as well as her involvement in programs for national higher education institutions, she has been a keynote, plenary, and invited speaker at several international conferences in different countries all over the world, including the Philippines. And we're glad to have, us, uh, to have her with us again today and here to deliver her paper titled Expression of Linguistic and Cultural Identity Among Young Malaysians of Portuguese Ancestry. Let's all welcome Dr. Stephanie Shamila Pillai. Thank you, Jackie. Hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here, even though it's not in person. So allow me to share my screen and fingers crossed that this will work. Here we go. All right. Okay, and I hope that um, everyone can see my screen. Yeah, Jackie? Okay. Yes, All right. Definitely. Okay, great. So allow me to begin and I'll just minimize this. Okay. All right, so I've, I've changed it a little bit. I, I realized that after, you know, looking at um, the, the data that we had, really it's, an, it's expressions of linguistic and cultural identity. And the focus is on young Malaysians of Portuguese ancestry. And I'm going to talk about them because obviously I don't fall into the young category anymore. So allow me to begin. Um, the main or the big question that I'll be um, addressing today would be how do young people with Portuguese ancestry in Malaysia express their self and cultural identity? 
So that's like the main theme running through my talk today on my presentation here. And um, I'll be looking at three things. And I know earlier there were questions about who are these Portuguese Malacca people, you know? So, um, well, if you want to know more, you might want to watch uh, Professor Andaya's talk because she did uh, give you a little bit of um, historical perspective on the Portuguese uh, who came to Malacca. And, and then um, we also had a talk by, um, by Margaret, yeah, uh, Sakisian last week, I think, who was looking at music and drama. So there's lots of information there and I don't really want to repeat that. But, I'll, but you know, the conference is talking about context and continu continuities. And therefore, I guess I have to touch on the contact, the contact that led to what is today. So I will then talk about the Malacca Portuguese people um, and focus mainly on number three, which is the, the young people, the young Malaysian Portuguese Eurasians. So the three things that I will be touching on, but focusing more on the third aspect. So let me um, start with the contact point here. And of course, you know, um, the Portuguese were here in 1511. And so the from that point on, that contact, and they were here till 1641, so quite a long time. Uh, in 1641, we had the Dutch coming over. So when they came here, uh, and they, they just didn't come on their own, right? Obviously, they, they were coming from Goa, um, from India, and they also had lots of different people on their ships, soldiers, slaves, and so on. So that contact of those people and locals um, led to a, a mixed group of people who exist till today in Malaysia, okay? So this is like just a very like a history in less than one minute for you um, because my focus now is, is coming on. That was the contact, but let's look at what's happening today. So as a result of that contact, we have the Malacca Portuguese people also called Kristang. Now there's a lot of... Um, controversies about the name Kristang because often when you ask people what they are they might say Kristang among among ourselves we might say we are Kristang or Genti Kristang Kristang people but then the word Kristang itself the etymology it's it means Christian so some people have an issue with that like how can you say I'm Christian when you don't mean the religion um, so in a way Kristang is like a three-in-one it it can mean the people, it can even mean the language, uh, Papa Kristang, to speak Kristang. Uh, again, people say, how can you say you're speaking Christian, right? That's just how it's evolved, okay? Um, and of course, Kristang meaning Christian, but, but in actual fact, we don't really say, oh, I'm Kristang to mean I'm Christian, because people would say I'm Catholic or I'm something else, you know? So it's a, it's a funny word. So I will be using Kristang and Malacca Portuguese kind of um, interchangeably. And so I ask for forgiveness for those who have an issue with the term Kristang right now. Okay, so in um, the Malacca people of Portuguese ancestry, we are really a minority. Most of us will be of mixed ethnicity. Uh, we make up the we are less than, I guess, 0 0.5 of the 1% of the Malaysian population. So you can imagine it's a very small group of uh, people. Um, the, the concentration of the people, Malacca Portuguese people, of course, can be found in Malacca. Some of you may have already been to Malacca, what it looks like today. So um, it, um, it is a, a historical site. So so a lot of people go visit, a lot of tourists go and visit it. It's south of Kuala Lumpur, for those of you who don't know where it is. And in Malacca, um, because of its history and because in the 1930s, a village was set up. Yeah, the, you can see the kind of the, at the entrance you have, it's called the Portuguese Settlement uh, or Kampong Portuguese in uh, Malay. And here you have about 1,000, 1,005, maybe 2,000 if you um, consider the area just around the, the Portuguese settlement, um, a coastal village uh, where you have a concentration of Malacca Portuguese people. And because of this village, the language, Papia Kristang or Malacca Portuguese, Creole, has survived till today. Now, of course, the number of fluent speakers um, are dwindling, but um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, that there are some efforts to, to keep it going. But in any case, so the contact with the Portuguese in the 16th century led to this mixed group of people um, who exist till today and who have a language of their own, Portuguese-based Creole. Yeah. So that's the first two parts that I want to uh, just wanted to share with you. But now let's get to the main part of my big question, how do Malaysian Portuguese Eurasians, particularly the young people, how do they see themselves today? 
Right. So for that, um, you know, there's always a, a lot of questions about how do you know your Portuguese? Oh, from my surname, or how do you know your Portuguese? Because my great grandmother or my grandmother was uh, had a, a surname like Rodrigo, uh, like like Santa Maria or De Costa, yeah. Um, but the thing is, unlike the Chinese or the Indians in Malaysia who may be able to trace their ancestry to a particular village, a particular area in China or India, um, most Portuguese Eurasians will not be able to, to do that. They, you don't know where in Portugal or who was the Portuguese person who came, who first came and, and started your whole ancestry, right? So it's a little bit different. And then to be classified under others. So you're not Indian, you're not Chinese, you're not Malay or uh, indigenous, you're just an other. It's kind of uh, a rather, it can be quite negatively, you know, perceived, right? You don't, your sense of identity. So how do people of Portuguese ancestry create that identity for themselves? So I want to look at that, that whole concept of identity. And because... Um, I feel that identity is something that we construct. It's not just something that's given to us, especially when you're, you're not sure and, and it's diff, it, you may be of mixed um, ancestry, mixed parentage. So you construct and you may have several identities that you construct at different points of your life or even within the same period of time. So the three sub-questions I'm looking at uh, would be how do we uh, construct, how, how do the young Portuguese Eurasians construct themselves in terms of language choice? How do they construct them? And, and do they do it in a very different way? Do they, they separate themselves from everyone else? And is there some kind of stable process of social determination among them? These are questions that I had looked at with a former colleague in a previous publication, and but that was among mainly older um, Eurasians, Portuguese Eurasians, and mainly those who lived in Kuala Lumpur. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, whether there were similarities uh, with the young people today. Yeah. So to move on. So in this, I was going to interview people, but because we're still under kind of lockdown, we still can't travel even out of district. Um, I didn't want to interview people online. So we're still in, in the process of getting deeper into it. But a preliminary, I'm just sharing the preliminary data um, in relation to the young people, those aged between 18 and 30. And you can see the majority of them were aged 27 to 30, but most of them are in their 20s, really. Um, most, we had many females, okay, so we had about 32 uh, respondents that I'm sharing with you today, mainly single. Interestingly, most of them declared being Roman Catholic, so not surprising, given the Portuguese heritage. Uh, most of them live in the Klang Valley, um, the ones who responded, but um, slightly less than half of them had actually lived, they actually live now or have lived in the Portuguese settlement. And again, this is quite telling in the sense that many people leave the, you know, have left the village to work outside of Malacca, um, even outside of Malaysia, but because of job opportunities, higher education and so on, you know. So uh, mainly at the end of the day, you get the very young and the very old uh, left in the village, the middle group, Will tend to work outside of Malacca. Okay, so um, given that, um, here comes an, a very interesting thing, something that I get asked all the time. What, what, what are you? This is a very common question. What are you? Like human being? Uh, but that is a, a common question and uh, people will ask you uh, or people will say, what mix are you? Now, in Malaysia, we have state-defined race, okay? So you're classified as being um, either Malay or Indigenous person or Bumiputra, um, Chinese, Indian or others. Now, um, so most people of Portuguese ancestry uh, will be classified as others, but because in Malaysia, the tendency is to follow the father's um, ethnic background or race, um, you can see here that you've got people who are classified as Indian, Chinese, and Malay, and, and more than half of them classified as others, okay? So the, the interesting thing then, if we compare with how, when you ask people, okay, fine, that's on your identity card, I might be Indian, right? And even though I'm of mixed parentage. So, but how do they identify themselves? Look at how many percent of them identify themselves as mixed and Eurasian. A couple of them said Portuguese, but of course they mean Malaysian Portuguese. They are Malacca Portuguese, not Portuguese from Portugal. So it's quite telling what the state defines you as and what you see yourself as being, okay? Um, and here's another um, 
another interesting thing, right? So do they um, do do people agree that that um, they are the same as other other Portuguese Eurasians? Well, they they may not see themselves the same, and this is again quite controversial, and we. And it's, it is debatable, like, why do you want to classify yourself differently from other Eurasians in Malaysia when you guys are such a small group? So this is something that inter we want to have interviews so that we can delve deeper into what is motivating people to want to distinguish themselves into even smaller groups, yeah? Okay, um, so next. So this is how they define themselves. So state might define you as one one thing, but you you see yourselves as something else, and we can see that um, the majority of them say that they try to maintain Christian traditions or Malacca Portuguese traditions, like in weddings, in funerals, right? Um, at Christmas, they do certain things, and this is because also that they define um, Christian culture in a particular way. When you ask them, "What to you is Christian culture?" they'll say, majority of them. Huh, look at food and um, Noel was talking to me about you must talk about the food and you can see here that food comes up very strongly as one of the markers of cultural identity that if you don't know about uh, you know about certain food like oh I don't know you've never tasted devil before or, de or curry devil okay or you've never you you can't be Christian if you don't know what that is okay so uh, and if you don't know how to cook it maybe or you don't serve it in your house um, then how can you say you are Christian so whether you cook or serve um, Christian food or Malacca Portuguese food is one of the 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 kind of markers of Christian culture. Um, and then comes the ability to speak and of course to practice traditions. As I said, many majority of them said that they would try to, um, they, they try to maintain some of these practices. And um, of course, dancing the brand new, which is uh, Margaret talked about this in her talk. Um, and uh, she had some videos as well. So you could watch that recording if you want to know what the brand new is. Um, and what is interesting is that clothing came like sort of last of the list, which is interesting because there's always this juxtaposition, right? There's always this um, juxtaposition of the touristy stereotype um, vision or identity of a Malacca Portuguese or Christian person that you see wearing particular kinds of clothes, kabaya or the, the folk, folk costume, which really isn't something that came along in the 16th century. So clothing is not the identity. And, and nobody, I mean, these are things you wear during occasions. So you can't tell outright when you see someone because we don't wear kabaya all the time, right? Or, or at all, maybe for some people. But the food and traditions, practicing the traditions and ability to speak appear to come out very strongly again and again. And we shall see this. If you say, how, you, how would you describe a person? So, so earlier was, what do you define as Christian culture? Here we're looking at uh, how would you describe a Christian or Portuguese person? Again, you can see, okay, language is there, but also culture, something called unique. This is again something we want to go into. What do you mean by this person is unique? What are the characteristics? Some people would say, oh, they have a particular way of speaking. Um, you know, or, or they, they have a particular way that they behave that makes them stand out. This is something that some people don't seem able to put their finger on, but it's obviously something that's in the back of their mind um, that they can, they can, I know that's a Christian person because they're different, yeah? Uh, they're different. So another thing that comes out also very strongly is the family unit. And I think that also has to do with the religion. Um, being Catholic, you tend to have big families, so the family unit is very important. Okay, now, what makes you a Christian person? So now we look at, you know, a self-identification. And again, we see family coming out strong. So your sense of family, your, your focus on family is important. And then um, food, again. So food is also very important. Food seems to be really something that's permeating what, what constitutes Christian culture, yeah? And you also have traditions there. So, I, so these three things to keep in mind that for the Christian person, food, family, but all, and traditions are very important. The PC there refers to Papa Christian. So language is also in, an important factor in making you Christian. But as we shall see, ha, here is the kind of dilemma, right? 
if you ask people who say that language is an important aspect of or important cultural marker for a Kristang person or a Malacca Portuguese person, yet we can see here that in terms of numbers, right, um, only, only like one person out of the 32 said that that was their first language. Kristang was their first language, okay? Um, um, and most for, for, for many of them, yes, they can speak it, uh, but um, um, they, they didn't consider it as their first language. And only seven of them felt that they spoke it fairly well and only two said that they spoke it very well. And um, only three each spoke to their mothers and fathers in Kristang, which suggests maybe uh, at the parents' generation, so their parents might probably be in their 50s or 60s, already do not use, uh, their parents already do not use Malacca Portuguese as a first or dominant language. Instead, most of them um, would use um, English as their first language, okay, as their first language. So together, some together, being bilingual, multilingual in Malaysia, speaking Malay as well, um, they would also use Portuguese, uh, they would also use uh, Portuguese together with English, okay. Um, so, so those who said they were, so, and the majority of them obviously use English with their, with their parents as well. So here are some, some, you know, some statements, some quotes from some of our previous interviews with people. And this was very common among young people um, when we asked them, you know, what language did you grow up speaking? And most of them would say English, English with parents, English with siblings, English with um, relatives, especially outside of the Portuguese settlement, especially outside of Malacca, right? But even, even in the settlement, we do get, you know, uh, young kids, young children. Uh, one of my students did a study on this recently on very young children. And, you know, when she said, okay, come, let's talk to me about yourself in, in Malacca Portuguese, a lot of them were struggling. Um, they would switch to, to a Malay, colloquial Malaysian English or, or English um, with Malay words thrown in rather than uh, speak totally in Kristang. Okay, so, so this is quite common. My mom, my grandparents, they'll speak in Kristang, but most of the time we answer in English because we don't know, so we answer in English. So what happens is even though there's one way of Kristang, you know, it's only one way. Kristang comes in one way. There's, there's no, the intergenerational transmission is becoming less and less as younger parents uh, also do not speak Kristang very fluently. And um, in a way that's happened to many families, including um, my own. And I think Baxter had said even in the 1800s, uh, English was already, with the British being here, with English you know, medium schools being set up at that time, English became the language of prestige, the language of employment, yeah? Um, but having said that, um, I have to give due recognition to all the people who are working so hard to ensure even in these very difficult times uh, that, are, that are facing every one of us and particularly people in Malacca, particularly people in the Portuguese settlement, people like Sarah Santa Maria and many others who are working very hard to still ensure that children are learning the language, ensuring that the culture is being passed on. And hopefully when the pandemic is over, uh, these things will move uh, physically, right? Right now, Sarah is doing classes online and um, I have to salute her for not giving up even during these difficult times. Ah, right, so so going back to this again, um, which I, I, I had said earlier, that Christian people of, or rather people of Portuguese heritage, even though you might be classified as Indian like me or Chinese or Malay or something else, right? Still 100%, proud of our MP heritage. And how do we identify that heritage? Mainly through food, family relations, the, the focus on family, but also language, except that for language, uh, we may not be fluent in it. However, because language is seen as an important cultural marker, there seems to be of late a resurgence, a desire among people of Portuguese heritage to relearn, to learn this language again. And um, that's why efforts being done by Sarah and many others in the settlement and beyond, very, very important, yeah? Um, so that 
because they already feel accepted. So, so lang language, family, food, three important characteristics. So just, I'm coming to the end. <laughs> I realized that I only have 15 minutes. So I, I, when we talk about how do they, how do young Portuguese Eurasians construct themselves in terms of language choice, we can see that they are mainly English speaking, but that doesn't really matter. Language is not related directly to their sense of who they are, even if they feel speaking um, like a Portuguese is important, all right? So do they construct themselves uh, radically diversely? It seems as if they are. Words like unique, words like, like the, the fact that almost half of them seem to want to distinguish themselves from other Eurasians, Dutch Eurasians, uh, people of British heritage or other mixed, mixed Pan-Asians gives us a sense that yes they want to distinguish themselves but why how that's something that I need to go into further yeah so is there a stable process of de determination again poor, we don't know because as Margaret said in her talk Margaret Saki said there seems to be this uh, breaking up reconstruct deconstructing reconstructing um, who of who you are your traditions your cultural traditions as we go through different stages of our history, of our political, social, economic changes. So perhaps the young people are forging an identity of their own. And particularly as they move away from the settlement, away from Malacca, uh, those who live in the Klang Valley, for example, and they themselves are mixed of mixed heritage. Um, they have families and friends from different, different um, ethnic groups. They are forging identity in different ways. And one of the key things that's coming up, and we can even see through all the online food that's being sold, um, it's through food. So food is very, very, um, it's one of the key cultural elements for the young Malacca Portuguese, I think, anyway. So that's, that's actually um, all I want to share today. I do have some readings and I can share the slides later or you can watch this. So I'll just leave this on a little bit. If any of you want any of these papers and you don't have access to them, just uh, let me know. And, um, and yeah, that's it. Muito grande. Merci. Thank you very much for having me. And I will attempt to stop sharing now. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Stephanie Shanila Pillai. So uh, that's her first uh, paper presentation for this afternoon. Our next uh, speaker uh, is Mr. Jose Genaro Duce Apaizon. And he's the president of the Colegio de la Ciudad de Zamboanga. He is the project director of Chabacano Lexicography and of Puento de Chabacano. Since the 1990s, he has taught or served as an administrator of various institutions of higher learning, including the Western Mindanao State University, the Philippine Normal University, Adamson University, the University of Santo Tomas, and the Ateneo de Manila University. From 2014 to 2018, he was the assistant city administrator of the local government unit of Zamboanga to deliver his paper titled Zamboanga Chabacano Structure and Grammar. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Jose Genaro Yap Aizon. Good morning to everybody. My topic is about the Samoa Chabacano structure and grammar. So my presentation is about the study I conducted to describe the grammar accounts of Samboanga Chabacano. This was to pave the way for the eventual codification of the Chabacano language. This study actually proved to those who otherwise claim that the Samboanga Chabacano has no grammar and has no grammar rules of its own. Moreover, this study proved that Samboanga Chabacano is not a bastardized Spanish language. The grammar accounts are the descriptions of the subconscious language grammar rules that the Chabacano speakers of the language are using. Since the time the pidgin was developed and eventually transformed into a Creole language, 
the native Sambongueños were able to understand one another. This only means that there are certain grammar accounts that they subscribe to unconsciously without knowing that these were grammar rules. My co-researchers in the study, or my key informants, were those who were native speakers of the Chabacano language. Their parents and grandparents were natives of the city and speakers of the language. They were 50 years old and above, male and female, coming from the geographical center in the west and the east coast of Samuanga City. In the first phase of the data gathering of my study was in the form of informal casual conversations with the natives in their houses. The conversations were about topics on the Semana Santa, that's Holy Week, Todos Los Santos, that's All Saints Day, Pascua, that's Christmas, and Entierro, which are burial rites and rituals. The activities in the parish church and practically anything under the sun. All the conversations were audio recorded, transcribed, and made ready for linguistic analysis. Bracketing and coding were used in the analysis. Similar and dissimilar sentence utterances were grouped together eventually to develop into themes of grammar accounts and sentence structures. And the second phase of the data gathering was in the form of interviews for the clarification and validation. The developed themes of grammar accounts and sentence structures were validated by the native speakers themselves. Now I'm going to discuss about the, the important grammar rules in Samoa Chabacano. There were 42 grammar accounts established in this study, but only the most important will be discussed in this presentation. So the grammar account 11, personal pronouns are ele, that's he, she, him, her, ese, it, sila, they, the suyo, his, hers, the ila, theirs, canila, them, con ese, that, con este, this, con es, esos, them, con estos, them. The pronouns agree only in number with the noun daily place. Example, if you say, si Maria ay anda na escuela, ele ay presta mga libro na library. So you don't change anymore ele to ele, there is no such thing in Chabacano. Si Silverio ya anda na mar, ele ya pesca. So either Maria or Silverio, Maria is a feminine, Silverio is a male, they both use ele as a pronoun. Grammar account number 12. The subject noun of the sentence, regardless of number and person, require a constant form of the verb. So, in Chabacano, you say, ta plus base form of the verb, that's present tense. Ya plus base form of the verb, that's past tense. And I or el plus base form of the verb, that's for future. So, if the verb is sing, you say, ta canta. Past, sang, ya canta. Will sing is I canta or el canta. Grammar. Account 13, the silent understood linking verb. In the Sambuanga Chavacano, the linking verb is silent. Or in other perspective, one can say that it is understood to be present in the sentence. So for example, if you say, my friend is very rich, so Chavacano is say, mi amigo bien rico. There is no is, is is silent. In, Chava, in Spanish, you can say, mi amigo es rico or está rico. In Chabacano, that's understood. Grammar count 14. In Samoa Chabacano, the verb does not change even if the subject is compound, connected by the words e or pati. Si Gregorio si Joaquim tanda na escuela temprano. Si Gregorio tanda na escuela temprano. So even if it's plural or singular, tanda is used. It's not changed. Grammar account 15. In Samoa Chabacano, the verb does not change even if the subjects are connected by or, o, ni, ninguno, nor. Mga bata o si Pedro tahuga o nalbola. Ninguno del mga bata o si Pedro tahuga o nalbola. Or even if the subjects are reversed, the verb form does not change. Si Pedro o mga bata tahuga o nalbola. Mga bata is plural, tahuga is used. And then you say, for example, si... Ninguno del mga bata o si Pedro, tahuga ko nalbola, Pedro is singular, but tahuga is still used. Grammar account 16. The present perfect tense in Samoa Chabacano expressing indefinite past action and action just completed use ya plus simple form of the verb plus another ya. So for an action just completed, you say, si Paulo ya llega ya. Paulo has just arrived. 
for an indefinite past action, you say, Yaan Daya Ele na Hong Kong. He has gone to Hong Kong. Grammar account 17. The past perfect tense uses ya plus the simple form of the verb plus another ya. It is the same structure with the present tense perfect tense. However, there are two past actions in the sentence. This distinguishes the past perfect tense from the present perfect. So you say, El sol ya subi ya antes ya desperta si Martha. The sun had risen before Martha woke up. Antes kami asenta para comer, ya prepara ya kami con el mesa. Before we sat down to eat, we had already set the table. Grammar account 18. The future perfect tense expresses the first of two future actions or an action that will be completed before a very definite time in the future. The form is I plus simple form of the verb plus ya. Example, I camina ya yo antes le ailega. In English, I shall have gone before he arrives. Another one, ailega ya le maga media noche. He will have arrived by midnight. Grammar account 19. The progressive tenses emphasize the continuation of the action of the verb. Sometimes it takes the form taman plus simple form of the verb for the present tense, yaman plus simple form of the past tense, and aiman plus simple form of the future tense. More often than not, it is simply ta, ya, or i plus simple form of the verb, which is no different from the simple present, past, and future tense forms. Example, el maestro taman cuento con el mga estudiante. The teacher is talking with the students. Number two, el maestro yaman cuento con el mga estudiante. The teacher was talking with the students. Number three, el maestro ayman cuento con el mga estudiante. The teacher is talking with the students. Ay anda kami na iglesia. We are going to church. Grammar account 20. The equivalent of the infinitive in English, to plus simple form of the verb, is para plus simple form of the verb. However, in many instances, para can be omitted. Example, hindi fácil para habla el verdad. It is not easy to tell the truth. Or when para is deleted, you say, hindi fácil habla el verdad. Number two, tapla niya sila para presenta un drama. They plan to present a play. Grammar account 20. The English perfect infinitive to plus have plus past participle form of the verb is equivalent to dol plus ya plus simple form of the verb in the active voice. There is no distinct structure for the perfect infinitive in the passive voice in Zamboanga Chabacano. In the same manner, there is no distinct structure for the passive voice. So when the sense of the sentence is in the present, the dol ya is omitted. Example, Ta cre que el viejo dolia mira con el alma dentro de su cuarto. In English, the old man is believed to have seen the ghost inside his room. Number two, ta parece que dolia le si julia el libro que bien sabe mangayot le por causa del mga animal na mala. Julia appears to have read the book because she knows a lot about the animals in the ocean. My second topic is about the Sabuacano language structure. In the 2003 study of Nim Farebolios Edin, the Sabuacano was identified to have seven language structures. Number one, subject, verb, object. Number two, subject, verb, objective, complement. Number three, subject, linking, verb, complement, noun. Number four, subject, verb, adverbial phrase. Number five, subject, expletive, verb, object, adverb, phrase. Number six, subject, object, adverbial, phrase. And number seven, subject, complement one and complement two. With the knowledge that living languages are not limited to vocabulary and structure, a longitudinal study lasting five years replicating the editing paper was conducted to determine what has become of the structure of the Sabuama Chabacano as used by the Sambongenos themselves in their daily conversations with one another. Definitely, there have been some conspicuous changes in the way Sambongenos utter their sentences. When compared today and five years ago, 
It is of the belief that this is futile to prescribe a community of a language they are to use. The success, rather, would be to describe what they are using in the present. As Peter M. Brown has iterated, there is no limit as to the number of structures that can be created with one language alone. So the seven language structures of the Samuama Chabacano. It has been the perception of outsiders, the non-Chabacano native speakers, who are doing linguistic research that the language structure of the Samuama Chabacano is distinct because the components of the sentence can be placed in the beginning, in the middle, or the end without changing the sentence's meaning. For example, it is grammatically correct to put the subject in the beginning, middle or end without changing the meaning of the sentence. However, it will be shown that not all combinations or variations are acceptable. This means that none of the native Chabacano speakers make use of some unacceptable structures and variations. And semantically, some meanings of the sentences are changed. In the following structures, the diverse ways of declaring sentences in the Samoan Chabacano are explained and the acceptable and the unacceptable ones. Let's take a look at the first structure. Structure one, subject, verb, object. So all combinations are possible. In this structure, there are three clusters of variation, the subject in the beginning, the verb in the beginning, and the object in the beginning. When the subject is in the beginning of the sentence, the verb and or the object may either be placed in the middle or the end. Example, Subject, verb, object. Si Pedro takobe durian. In English, Pedro eats durian. Next, subject, object, verb. Si Pedro durian takome. In English, Pedro durian eats, which is not acceptable in English. When the verb is in the beginning of the sentence, the subject and or object may be placed in the middle of the sentence or at the end. So we have the next structure, which is verb, object, subject. We say, Takome durian si Pedro. So you can start the sentence with takome, the verb. Takome durian si Pedro. In English, it's durian Pedro, not acceptable. Next structure, verb, subject, object. Takome si Pedro durian. So you say, you start with the verb takome, then you have si Pedro, and then durian. It's Pedro durian, not acceptable. When the object is in the beginning of the sentence, the subject and or the verb may be placed in the middle or the end. Let's take a look at this structure. Object, subject, verb. Durian ta si Pedro ta come. Durian Pedro eats. Next, object, verb, subject. Durian ta come si Pedro. Durian eats Pedro. Okay, so however, the most common structure used by the Sambongenos is structure, verb, object, subject. Based on the research, most Sambongenos speak with the verb first and then the, sub, uh, the object and the subject. So most among us would say, Takome durian si Pedro, which in English means, it's durian Pedro. So in Sambuanga, whenever one would ask any of the following questions about Pedro, the answer will be the verb, object, subject, language structure. In most circumstances, the response would cross out the subject, thus the structure verb, object is uh, followed. For example, if you ask, Cosa tasa si Pedro? In English, what is Pedro doing? The most common answer from the Sambongenos would be, Takome durian si Pedro. Or in English, it's durian Pedro. Okay? So the verb comes first. Next. Donde ya si Pedro? Next question. Where is Pedro? Talia. Takome durian si Pedro. There. It's durian Pedro. Next question. Ya mira tu kun Pedro? Have you seen Pedro? Talia, takome durian si Pedro. There, it's durian Pedro. Like most of the Filipino languages dialects, the verb is almost always in the beginning. My concluding statement for the Chabacano language structure. It may be convincingly inferred that there are almost always exceptions to the rule. There can be no sweeping statement that in the language structure of the Samoa Chabacano, the components of the sentences can just be placed anywhere, in the beginning, middle, or end. However, when compared with other languages or dialects, the Samoa Chapacano has lesser restrictions on the word order in the sentence. 
credit this to some extent to the etymology of the Chabacano, which is comparatively the youngest among Philippine languages, and its structural rules are either those that are adopted from the rules of other Filipino language or still, as in the case of all other languages, still evolving. It is established fact and likewise documented that when the Spaniards came to the Philippines, all other regional and local dialects or languages existed and used while Chabacano evolved as a natural consequence of the need to communicate with the new colonizers. As such, its language structure would be more or less adapted from the natives' original tongues. Moreover, it is not worthy to underscore that the findings in this linguistic research did not include the language structure in the interrogative question forms. As such, the descriptions and conclusions are only the limited to the seven language structures as initiated by Edding's study in 2003. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jose Genaro Yap Aizon. Uh, he can join us. Uh, he can't join us this afternoon, but we thank him for sending in his video presentation. Our next speaker, let me introduce her to you. Our next speaker is Dr. Eva Cipolla. She is the Associate Professor of Ibero-American Languages and Cultures at the University of Helsinki in Finland. Prior to this, she held posts at the University of Bremen in Germany and Aarhus University in Denmark. Her research interests broadly focus on contact linguistics and critical social linguistics. Dr. Cipolla is an expert on Chabacano, or Philippine Creole Spanish, and Ibero-Asian Creole languages. And she has several publications on descriptive, comparative, historical, and social linguistic aspects of these. She is the co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Postcolonial Linguistics. She has also edited volumes for John Benjamin's The Greuter, Language and Communication, and the Journal of Ibero Romance Creoles to present her paper titled Traces of Colonial Contacts, Hybrid Linguistic Ecologies in the Philippines. Here now is Dr. Eva M. Cipolla. I'm Eva Cipolla from the University of Helsinki, Finland. I'm going to talk about traces of contact, hybrid linguistic ecologies in the Philippines with focus on the chabacano speaking communities of Ternate and Cavite. I'm very happy to be part of this series of conferences on contacts and continuities, 500 years of Asian Iberian encounters. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. My apologies for not being here today in person. I am sure you will enjoy the panel discussion and the presentations by my fellow panelists. I will start with a quote from Mervyn Elaine's work, already from the 70s. He writes, we should be concerned if we wish to reconstruct the early language and language processes of Pidgin and Creole speakers with reconstruction of the social linguistic situation at the time of its formation with the structure of the communicative network and the communicative needs of different sectors of the population involved. In this presentation, I will be discussing these factors for the Chabocano speaking communities of Ternate and Cavite. There are six historically attested varieties of Chabocano in Manila Bay and in the Mindanao regions. There are three main varieties remaining in Cavite, Ternate and Zamboanga today. Speakers consider them to be separate but mutually intelligible. The Spanish Creoles of the Philippines are especially interesting for comparative studies and for testing hypotheses of language contact and its constraints. On the map, you see Cavite and Ternate uh, in blue circles. Cavite Chabacano is spoken in Cavite City. 
which has about 3,000 speakers, and most of them are of the grandparental generation. The variety is severely endangered. It is spoken in a mostly Tagalog-speaking region. Ternate Chabacano is spoken in the town of Ternate. It has about 3,000 speakers, and all of them are bilingual in Tagalog. Its status is threatened but relatively stable, as children are still learning the Creole. In this presentation, I'm going to compare the linguistic ecologies of the Chabacano communities of Camite and Ternate. I want to add to the debates on Spanish colonial legacies in the Philippines from a contact linguistic perspective. I also want to add to research that takes a holistic approach in examining contact language formation through ecological models. This presentation is structured as follows. After the background, I will examine the hybrid linguistic ecologies of the Chabacano speaking communities. I will focus on their linguistic differences and similarities and compare the social historical ecologies in Cavite and Ternate. Language ecology studies the interactions between any given language and its environment. It takes into account both internal linguistic and external social historical ecologies. It might include factors such as linguistic diversity, social networks, political economy, and demographic factors. Its impact on context studies has been important. They have added factors such as segregation, population replacement, time of arrival, and place of birth of the speakers into the picture. It is also important to remember that external ecological factors work through individuals as they interact or not with each other. Contact situations are laboratories for examining contact phenomena and motivations behind them to the benefit of the theory of language contact. As in the language ecological approach, both structural and social linguistic motivations have to be considered. Grammaticalization uh, or internal change and contact induced change, external change, often work jointly to trigger grammatical change. Universal processes of grammatical change are involved in the aerial diffusion of linguistic features, and this is especially relevant in social situations of large-scale bilingualism, as in many colonial contexts. Currently, there are different views about what kind of contact situations gave birth to Chabacano. The debate about the origins can be summarized in the following questions. Is there a common ancestor for the Chabucano varieties spoken in Cavite, Ternate, and Zamboanga? And are the varieties related beyond their obvious connection to the colonial language Spanish and the local Philippine languages? Already in the 1950s, the Wyndham proposed the theory of shared origins triggered by input from a contact variety transferred from Halmahera to the Manila Bay region in the 17th century. However, there is scant lexical evidence for this and uh, no attested grammatical properties. Winnom based his theory on the commonalities between Chabacano and other Lusurasian varieties that would have suggested a connection to a Portuguese based pidgin spoken in the region at that time. More recently, Fernandez and Lipsky have argued for independent formats and processes. There were many locations in the Philippines where Spanish was spoken in different ways, but where the Creole did not crystallize or has disappeared. And there are significant differences between the varieties as to their grammar and lexicon, and as to the Spanish and Philippine components in them. Although we do not know exactly when Chabucano was formed, we have linguistic evidence and linguistic commentary that help us to limit the time period for its crystallization. Chabacano has the restructured consonant system of modern Spanish, unlike many Spanish loans in Tagalog, for example. Chabacano thus most probably formed after the restructuring process had concluded in Spanish varieties in the late 17th century. In early 19th century, we have references to restructured Spanish spoken by non-European origin parts of the population. This restructured Spanish was Chabacano. 
This means that the Creole probably formed somewhere in the course of the 18th century. Today, our focus is on Cavite and Ternate. I'm going to explore what the main differences as to the structural profiles and grammaticalization paths are, and how do these differences reflect different social historical ecologies. Let us first have a look at the linguistic features. Here we have the results of a computational analysis of 72 grammatical data points on Spanish L1 and contact varieties. Variety type is a defining feature. Creoles and the Chabocano varieties group on the upper right side of the network, although with differences between them. Spanish L1 dialects are on the bottom of the network, while L2 varieties and Afro-Hispanic varieties form their own clusters. The Chabacana varieties show no low-level regional signal, as Cavite and Zambonga are closer to each other compared to Ternate, probably due to their proximity to Spanish. In addition, there are some differences in the expression of modality. The varieties have grammaticalized different Spanish forms, and they also use different uh, reduced forms for the verb puede. In addition, in Ternate, the Tagalog loan of Mari is used. Further differences can be found in reciprocal constructions and in argument marking. What is notable in these differences are the independent grammaticalization paths taken in each variety and the abstract influence in Ternate Chabacana. Let us now have a look at external factors in the linguistic ecologies of these varieties. In general, the contact with Spanish was quite limited. There were missionaries and military and administrator personnel but no numbers of settlers. Local laws and customs were maintained, although legal code was in Spanish. There was no general education system in Spanish and low numbers of population in general spoke Spanish. Today, there are low numbers of Spanish L1 speakers and Spanish in the Philippines has mainly European Spanish features due to the contact in the late 19th century. The Spanish history of Cavite is quite well known. The Spanish arrived in 1571 and two towns, Cavite Viejo and Cavite Nuevo, were founded some decades after. Maravi Clesho, in her study of Cavite Chabocano, based on several historical works, makes the following observations. Cavite served as the major port for the Manila Galleon trade. It had a strong Spanish military and administrative presence. Shipbuilding started already in the late 16th century. When the Spanish arrived, the population was around 1,500 people, and the population doubled by the year 1620, when the great majority were natives, about 2,400, and there were also 430 Spanish and 400 others, slaves and Molokans. The shipbuilders were mainly from Tagalog-speaking regions, but also from Pampanga. The Chinese presence probably connected to the trade also has been documented. The original populations of Cavite were then resettled Filipino laborers, mostly Tagalog speakers, Mexican-Spanish speaking soldiers and administrators, and Hokkien Chinese laborers and traders. Besho also mentions that intermarriage was probably common as there were few Spanish women in Cavite. For Ternate, there is much less historical information. The town was previously in the Spanish era known as Barra de Maragondon. It was located further south on the coast of the Manila Bay, facing the island of Corregidor. We know that since 1627, Jesuits were present in Maragondon. 
it is commonly thought that the founders of the present-day Ternate were free soldiers, Marticas, serving the Spanish, and who came from the island of Ternate in the Moluccas, today's Halmajera. We know that the Spanish fort in the Moluccas was evacuated in the 1660s, and some 10 years after, there is a mention of Marticas in Maragondor. However, whether these were Marticas from Ternate is unclear. Murillo Velarde, in 1749, tells that Mardicas came from Ternate in the Moluccas with their Santo Niño and were located in the coast of Maragondon to guard the entrance to Manila Bay. The same is confirmed by other historical documents from the 18th century. Especially notable is Murillo Velarde's comment on that the Mardicas used three languages, Spanish, that they used to talk to the priest and the Spanish, Tagalog, to speak to the local population, and their own, which they speak among themselves and teach to their children. Comparing this statement to other comments on restructured varieties of Spanish at the time, that often talk about corrupted Spanish, for example in Cavite, we can conclude that this own language was not the Creole, Chabucano, but their Moluccan language. Historical documentation on demographic numbers of Ternate is scarce, but from data from the early 19th century, we can conclude that there was a low number of Spanish in the town and a handful of Christian Sangles or Chinese in Maragondon. It is also worth noting that in 1870, Ferrando and Fonseca mentioned the separatedness of Parra de Maragondon and that its inhabitants rarely mixed with other populations in the region and kept to themselves. When comparing the external ecological factors in Cabite and Ternate, we find some significant differences as to the economic factors and the presence of Spanish in these towns. Also, as to the languages and the main demographic groups, there are some differences and other additional factors, such as closeness to Manila and isolation, should be taken into account. As a summary, we can point out the following internal ecological factors. The closeness to Lexifier in Cavite, more Philippine influence and independent developments in Ternate Chapacano, and some isolated lexical items that reflect the Moluccan past in Ternate. Some external ecological factors that should be taken into consideration are the limited contacts between the communities, the historical remoteness of Ternate and its uh, lower number of lexifier contacts in general. Also, the Spanish presence in Cavite is noteworthy since the beginning and even growing in the 19th century, as well as the role of the Chinese. As final remarks, I would like to give the following. Based on the study of the linguistic ecologies of Cavite and Ternate Chabocano, it seems probable that the varieties formed in different geographical and social linguistic contexts. They continue to develop in many similar ways. English borrowing and code switching is common in all communities, and there is still ongoing divergence between them. Does this reflect past practices and developments? Is something we should study in future investigations. In conclusion, I hope to have shown that the detailed examination of structural and social historical factors is needed to fully understand the hybrid linguistic ecologies of the Philippine Spanish Creoles and the consequences of contact that the Spanish colonial legacies have had in the Philippines. That's our third presentation for today. Uh, Dr. Cipola can't be with us here, but we thank her for her video presentation.
Uh, our final speaker, let me introduce you our final speaker. Uh, she's Professor, Doc, uh, Professor Irene Barrios Arnuco. Uh, she's an associate professor in the Department of English of De La Salle University in Manila. Let me share her picture. Oops, there she is. Okay. Um, she is a professor in the Department of English and Applied Linguistics of the De La Salle University, Manila, and she also obtained her PhD in Applied Linguistics in the same university. In addition to various undergraduate courses, she has taught graduate courses on second language acquisition and bilingualism. Her research interests include cross-linguistic influence, mother tongue-based multilingual education, and language education. To present her paper, Elements in Zamboanguenyo, Chabacano, let's welcome Professor Irene Barrios Arnuco. Thank you, Jackie. I actually recorded my presentation because uh, I wasn't sure about the weather in my area. I'm actually outside Manila. It's raining right now, so uh, and it has been raining for some days, so I decided to record it. And may I now ask the staff to please present or to please play the recording. Good afternoon. I am deeply honored and grateful to the organizers for inviting me to join this final panel titled Language and Identity Formation of the Conference Series Contacts and Continuities, 500 Years of Asian Iberian Encounters. I am deeply honored to share with you about Chabacano or Philippine Creole Spanish. The language is found to be a combination of linguistic features among language systems that helped shape the way it is today. It is typologically accusative which is a feature inherited from Spanish and Portuguese. It also incorporates other features of Austronesian languages with which it is in constant use. This is indeed an example of the mestizo quality that Javier Rescas discussed in his keynote speech last week. He said that a mixed quality is found in many domains of Filipino life, in culture, religion, architecture, food, language. Chabacano, a Creole, is one of the most obvious and lasting legacies of our Filipino Hispanic past. This final talk in this series will feature Austronesian influences in Sambangueño Chabacano and will also feature the accusative actancy structure in the grammatical properties of the language. It will also show cross linguistic influence among young Sambangueño Chabacano learners and how their errors in a picture description task shows or show the ways they manage the difference between their first language and a second language, Filipino. Sambongueño Chabacano is the regional lingua franca on the western part of the island of Pinto in the Philippines. It is one of the varieties of Chabacano or alternately Chavacano that is spoken in different parts of the country. Other varieties of Chabacano have either disappeared or have a few speakers. Ermiteño in Manila is extinct, while Dabaweño in Davao City may have no remaining speakers. Everhard, Simons, and Fennig 2020. Most Chabacano speakers in Cavite and Ternate also speak English and Filipino for social advancement, Cipola 2010 and 2013. Durante reported in 2000 that only a few elderly people spoke Chabacano in Cotabato City. Henuino 
reported similar findings in 2005. Among the variants, Sambongueño Chabacano is found to be stabilized by intergenerational language transmission, use in different domains, and local government policy, and we know 2005. Rubino reported in 2012 that there were over 360,000 people in the Sambuanga Peninsula who spoke Chabacano. This figure makes Sambuangueño as the most actively spoken Creole in the Philippines and contributes significantly to Chabacano being the largest Spanish-derived Creole in the world. People in Zamboanga City generally have positive attitudes to Chabacano as evidenced by its use in most domains. A total of 75,960 households reported to speak Zambongueño Chabacano in the home. This is 2014. Masses have regular schedules in Chabacano. The community continues to produce literature and entertainment in Chabacano. Television and radio programs are delivered either exclusively or primarily in Chabacano. And local ordinances and resolutions are supportive of the use of Chabacano. Chabacano is also offered as a learning area and as a language of instruction in kindergarten and first three grades of primary school. Chabacano is one of the eight major languages offered as a subject and as a medium of instruction in the mother tongue based multilingual education program of the Department of Education that started in school year 2012 2013. Given these community and institutional support across age levels and in most domains, Chabacano is given the language status of four or educational on Ethnologue's expanded graded intergenerational disruption scale. This status describes the language to be, and I quote, in vigorous use with standardization and literature being sustained through a widespread system of institutionally supported education. This is from Everhard, Simons and Fennig, 2020. Meanwhile, census data reveal that the language continues to be influenced by economic activity, population growth and ethnicity. The 2015 Philippine census categorizes Zamboanga City as the only highly urbanized city in Region 9, Zamboanga Peninsula, with a registered total population of 862,000 persons. The city also lands in the top 10 most populous cities in the country. Population in the city has grown dramatically over the last several decades from a posting of about 200,000 persons in 1970, the city has grown four times larger in 2010 over the 40 year period, PSA 2013. This dynamic population growth in the city is supported by the increasing number of ethnicities other than Sambongueño Chavacano. In the 2000 census, Sambuangueño Chabacano was the predominant ethnic group in Sambuanga City as reported by 45.5% of the total household population. A little over half of the total household population were of other ethnicities. Within the next decade, Sambuangueño Chabacano dropped to 38.4% of the total household population in the city whereas other ethnicities accounted for almost 60% of the population, NSO 2013. 
This mix of ethno-linguistic groups populating the city accounts for the multitude of languages spoken in the city. It can be noted though, that the use of Zambongenyo Chabacano as a mother tongue has decreased and that more than half of the total population in the city speaks some other regional or local language. Modern Zambongenyo Chabacano shows a mixed quality to it. The widespread immigration of Visayan speakers that took place at the turn of the 20th century greatly influenced its modern use. Cipola and Lesho, 2020. Rubino, 2008. Notably, Rubino explains that modern Sambongueño Chabacano has incorporated many Visayan elements, particularly from Cebuano. Stein Kruger, 2008, pointed out the great disparity between young and old speakers in his data. Many young speakers are proficient in Filipino, which is based on Tagalog. Sambongueño Chabacano continues to incorporate Tagalog, Rubino 2008. For example, the use of the Philippine and Klitik Ka as a second person pronoun in place of its more formal equivalent to in Sambongueño Chabacano, as in the example, donde Anda, where are you going, is observed to be used by many speakers of Sambongueño Chabacano. I refer largely to previous works of mine, Barrios 2006, Barrios and Bernardo 2012. What grammatical properties, particularly of Tagalog and Sino, are found in Sambongueño Chabacano? Austronesian influences in Sambongueño, Sambongueño are found in word order, plural pronominal system, nominative noun marking, and plural noun marking, among other areas. Like Tagalog and Cebuano, as well as many other Philippine languages, Chabacano exhibits a prototypically Philippine type verb initial word order, different from the SVO pattern in Spanish. A number of scholars share the observation that Chabacano is a VSO language. Home, 2001, Foreman, 2001, and Lipsky, 1987. They also agree that while SVO order may occur, VSO is still the unmarked order for Chabacano. A look at the structure of Sambongueño, Tagalog, and Cebuano shows that these languages share the same VSO structure here demonstrated in the following major grammatical categories. Nominal predicate clauses, adjectival clauses, Verbal clauses, prepositional predicate constructions. The influence of Cebuano on Sambongueño is conspicuously manifested in its pronominal system, specifically in the plural personal pronoun series, with the exception of nos otros, we, first person dual formal, vos otros, you, second person familiar, and ustedes, you, second person formal, which are Spanish derived. The Cebuano influence is demonstrated in all three basic cases. Nominative, which functions as the subject of both transitive and intransitive clauses. Genitive as a possession marker and accusative serving as the direct object. As a clear case of departure from its Austronesian dominant environment, Chabacan exhibits an accusative actancy structure that is different from the ergative structure characteristic of most Philippine languages. 
Reed and Liao, 2004, provide a comprehensive description of transitivity and ergativity of Philippine languages. This attention given to modern linguistic analysis showing that most Philippine languages are morphologically ergative prompted Foreman in 2001 to ask whether Chabacano fits into the ergative analysis. Nolasco in 2005 categorically stated that Chabacano is characterized as accusative, an inheritance from Spanish and Portuguese. 57 to 8 year old learners who spoke Chabacano as their L1 underperformed in a grammaticality judgment task and overgeneralized case marking patterns in a picture description task. The results between the Chabacano group and a comparison group, Cebuano, showed to be statistically significant. These errors are found to be caused by negative transfer from their accusative L1 to the ergative L2. A closer look at the patterns of incorrect case marking combinations in the Chabacano picture description data recorded for both intransitive and transitive constructions reveals patterns of case marking use that support negative <clears throat> excuse me, negative transfer for the transitive subject from L1, Chabacano to L2, Filipino. Noteworthy is the glaring error pattern of using a double nominative case marking for both arguments in the transitive sentence, such as, binasag ang bata ang bote, the child broke the bottle. Here we see that both the transitive subject and the transitive object are case marked nominative. How do some Bongenyo Chabacano children manage the difference between their first language and a second language Filipino in case marking? On verb use, it is interesting to note that all responses of the 50 Chabacano children used inflection on the verb, which is remarkable since the L1 verbal system is so simple that only one of the three pre-verbal markers, ya, past, ta, present, and I, future, or none, is attached to the base form of the verb. Analysis reveals that Chabacano children, despite coming from a simple verbal system in the L1, inflected their verbs, albeit incorrectly. The affixes used are mag, nag in past tense, in and um, and other idiosyncratic uses of affixes in that order. The prefix nag appears to be the most frequently used affix on the verb describing a transitive action as shown in a good number of responses. Nakbubura or nagbubura, ang lalaki ang blackboard. Naglalaro si Giovanni ang bola. Nagahabol ang bata ang aso. Root verbs in the L1 also make use of nag as the equivalent of ya or yan in Chabacano. Nagrompe ang papel, ang lalaki at ang babae. Nagtuktok ang doorbell si Janeline. Nagtitira ang lalaki ang bola. Nagpatsa ang bola ang lalaki. The prefix nag is also used to attach to root verbs in English, resulting in borrowings as shown in the following examples like nag erase ang bata ang blackboard and nag lock ang pinto si Janeline. 
Analysis also reveals the range of affixes young Chabacano children use incorrectly with verb focus. Morphological marking on the verb in the double nominative argument construction is the use of the in, but used incorrectly with verb focus as marked by the nominative agent. For example, sinusunog ang bata yun libro. Binabasag ang bata ang bote. Pinindot si Janeline ang doorbell. Five Chabacano children also use the verbal prefix na to the root of the transitive verb as shown in these uh, examples. Napunit ako ng papel. Nabasag ang botelya ang lalaki. Napunit ang bata ang papel. The resulting verb changes the meaning of the sentence into something that is unintentional or unexpected and does not capture the action as depicted in the stimuli. Overall, picture descriptions by seven to eight year old Chabacano children acquiring L2 Filipino reveal that verb inflection is evident in picture descriptions of young L2 acquirers of Tagalog. None of the participants produce descriptions with no inflection. It suggests that as children age, their ability to use affixation is developed as well, even if their L1 background is, by contrast, too simple. Next, kind of affixes used on the verb varied significantly on the type of L1 background. The kinds of affixes used on verbs were more varied among L2 acquirers of Tagalog whose L1 is typologically different from L2. Last, children whose L1 differed typologically from the L2 produce more errors in the affixation on the verb, which interacted with verb focus. Language typology appears to affect developmental stages of proficiency in the acquisition of noun and verb marking. If we were to visualize the findings on voice marking among Filipino children from toddlers through preschool and to the primary grades, we would generally expect to see increasing proficiency as suggested by data in the literature. However, language typology alters the direction for learners whose L1 features differ from the L2. This presentation has attempted to show that Chabacano is indeed of mixed quality, linguistically speaking. There are many parallels on syntax and pronominal use, among others, between Chabacano and Austronesian languages, such as Tagalog and Cebuano. But it also has traces of Spanish and Portuguese, specifically in its actancy structure or the way subjects and objects are marked in transitive and intransitive sentences. Data show that young Chabacano children experience challenges in acquiring case marking in L2 Filipino because of the phenomenon of negative transfer of L1 properties to L2. Children are found to overgeneralize the ang noun marker as well as overemploy a variety of verbal affixes, particularly mag, to compensate for a lack of affixation in their L1 as they acquire a highly complex verbal system in the L2. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Irene. Marios Arnuco, and that rounds up our presentations for today. We now proceed to the question and answer part of our uh, program. And uh, we will entertain questions from our friends here in the Zoom room. 
uh, from the YouTube comment section and from Facebook. Once again, our community managers, Dr. Noel Rodriguez and Ms. Jubilin Nervis will monitor these channels and relay your questions to us. But before we start with uh, the Q&A, uh, I'd like to ask our uh, speakers who are here with us this afternoon, Dr. Pillai and Dr. Ar Arnuko, if you have uh, any words um, regarding uh, each other's presentations. Doc Steph first. <laughs> I was gonna say I, I was gonna say Irene first. Okay. Um, no, thank you very much for this opportunity. I really enjoyed um, listening to all the presentations um, and seeing how you know the other three were mainly focused on uh, you know Shabakano, but whereas uh, Malacca Portuguese obviously has a more Port has a Portuguese. Um, lexicon but the but there are some the the structure in terms of this you know to see how the similarities and to see also how different community different community two different communities really um have embraced this creole and still speak it and then you have this contact coming in from the majority language as well um i know that the the other presentations were more grammatical, more sort of linguistic and mine wasn't. I wasn't focusing on linguistic because I thought, ha, huh, this is identity. I want to look at identity and context. But still, it is within the structure. I mean, when we look at identities, we also look at the structure. And um, I mentioned one of um, the work that one of my students had done recently, and she was looking really at how their English now, right? So it's not even the Kristang because they're not fluent in Kristang or like a Portuguese, now their English is taking on a very different structure from the colloquial variety that I might use. And I thought that was fascinating because now we have like a, a different layer coming in. So it was really interesting, like what I know Irene was bringing up and seeing that is this, this is like, um, you know, what is their first language? What is their second language? What's the influence? And then um, how is the different are the different languages affecting each other? So the interesting thing with the with the children or the young children who are speaking um Malacca, but or, or don't speak Malacca Portuguese, speaking this new variety of of uh, of English, maybe it's Christanglish, you know, and how that is affecting the standard variety of English that they they need to learn in school or, you know what I mean? So there's like all these different layers. So things are a lot more complex, I think. Sometimes when you just look at the linguistic examples, you don't see the complexities, but there's also this hidden identity there actually uh, in people's choice. So if you have different repertoires, if you have the Kristang version of English, Kristanglish, then you have the Malaysian colloquial variety, and then you can also use standard the standard variety that you use at work or at in education. Then you have all these different languages in your bag you know, linguistic bag of your repertoire, right? And you can actually like pick them out um, for your different identities, you know, to, and it empowers you. But if you don't, and because, you know, languages are never treated equally, whether you like it or not, that's where the danger is. So if your Shabagana children or students and my, you know, the Malacca Portuguese children do not have certain varieties in their repertoire, like, and you know it's going to be the standard variety, right, uh, for job opportunities and so on, that might actually disempower them. So we're not saying like you have to dismiss the other varieties, um, which are considered like maybe the lower social varieties by some people, but we're saying it's good to also have the other variety because that's your ticket to um, employability to higher education you know that kind of thing and, and about who you are so yeah I think that's all I wanted to say because it's kind of difficult to to merge the linguistic side and um, the identity in like two minutes so <laughs> thank you so much for this opportunity though thank you very much for those insights Dr. Pillai uh, we actually have a couple of uh, uh, comments and questions here for you a very interesting presentation Dr. Stephanie um, there's a question from Robin de las Reyes. Uh, do young Malaysians with Portuguese ancestry mix features of Portuguese, Bahasa, and English? If so, is it accepted by their community? Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I think I responded in the YouTube <laughs> chat as well. Um, it's 
well, when when if you look at Kristang itself, it already has uh, Malay words, you know, in it. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you use the Malay word, you're not even aware that it's a Malay word because it's already changed over time. Um, and then you also have words which have been replaced by English. So things like auntie, you know, or auntie uh, instead of tia, for example. So so over time, uh, lots of English words are coming in. Of course, there are also Dutch words, there are local words. And being multilingual, just like the Filipinos, you know, when we speak English, it is um, among ourselves in, in informal situations. I am not going to sound like this at all, mm. right? I will be speaking uh, a mixture. I will speak English and I'll throw in Malay. I might have some Chinese words, some Tamil words. Yeah, that is very, very common, even among fluent speakers. Because we're fluent in English, um, so it is it accepted. Yeah, it's accepted. I mean, it's almost like a norm. It would be, it, it is probably only in very formal senses that we stick to one, uh, I would say one form of English or one form of Malay, for example. So it's very mixed. Yeah. Thank you, and also from Joseph Hill, um, he said it would be wonderful to hear spoken Kristang compared to Iberian Portuguese. What other languages or cultures have influenced Kristang? Okay, um, I've actually given some links in the, um, in the YouTube chat. So you can listen to people like Sarah, Santa Maria talking. And I've also got videos in the ILA archive. Um, my my Kristang will probably sound very anglicized, so I'm not you. I'm not gonna do it and get to, at bricks thrown at me. But um, yeah, it's obviously over time the whatever the Portuguese that came at that time would already probably have been a mixed variety as well because the Portuguese were traveling around, right? Um, and it is not true that it is an ancient Portuguese that has survived. So over time. Um, the lexicon is largely still Latin based. So I would see like um, kumi, for example, comer, right? Eat um, and uh, bebe for drink. So a lot of the vocabulary, if you speak Spanish, especially Spanish, I think you can recognize because of the pronunciation. The pronunciation has become, it's very reduced in terms of its vowel system, for example, consonant system. It's nothing like Portuguese, right? It's more. It's got a more Asian flavor, I would say, um, and and the grammar as well, the structure, um, as pointed out by Irene and the other speakers for Jabakano, similar things have happened with um, Kristang. And in terms of the vocabulary, of course, when the Dutch came, so you've got Dutch words like kalkun for Turkey, for example, and then you have Malay words, you um, especially for food items, and you and and because Malacca had contact with Indian languages, Chinese uh, dialects and languages, so you have words from uh, different uh, different languages in Kristang itself. Yeah, but you know what happens when you start using it on a daily basis? You don't even realize that um, mm -hmm. those words belong to another <laughs> another language. Yeah, um, yeah. So it it would definitely sound different because the grammar is not like um, European Portuguese or Iberian. Portuguese, uh, but the words may be recognizable, but because Portuguese sounds very different, if you compare it to Spanish, for example, Spanish is more phonemic, I think that Spanish speakers and uh, Brazilian Portuguese speakers probably can, um, can, can recognize the vocabulary better than Iberian Portuguese. That's what I'm told. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pillai. Uh, this uh, next uh, question is actually for Dr. Aizon. Uh, this is from Voltaire Araza. So maybe uh, Dr. Irene Arnuko can also ans try to answer this. Um, hey. What is the morphosyntactic alignment of Zamboanga Chavacano, nominative accusative, ergative absolutive, or active stative? It's a very, very oh, technical. It's technical. <laughs> it's technical. Yes, yeah, it's yes. presentation and also uh, Giorgio's presentation. I call him Giorgio, he's a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, we both um, highlighted the typological structure of Chabacano in, in the specific area of case marking, uh, how objects and subjects in transitive and intransitive sentences are marked. And categorically, Nolasco in 2005 um, said, that it is typologically uh, accusative. 
it is different from the ergative typological structure of most Philippine languages, wherein the marker for the subject and object in transitive and in transitive sentences change. For example, la uh, kinain ko ang manga. And uh, that's for the transitive construction for the in, for the intransitive nahulog ako. So kinain ko ko is in its ergative form, and then nahulog ako is it is in its uh, uh, nominative form. Okay, but in Chabacano, the marker does not change at all. So you have, uh, for example, for the first sentence, yako uh, meyo kunal manga yo, okay, and then in the intransitive uh, sentence yakayo yo, okay. So it does not change. So the problem now, <laughs> when I was doing my work on uh, acquisition of a second language, uh, I was wondering how how learners would um, use these case markings. Because when I was growing up, and I'm sure Dr. Noel here can, can resonate with my ideas. No, I, I really had a difficulty learning uh, Filipino. It was uh, really like a major uh, foreign language to me when I was uh, reading El Fili and Noli. I had a, a book translated in English so that I could understand the one in Filipino. So I was wondering when I was doing my uh, dissertation, if at all the differences in the grammatical uh, structure of Chabacano and a second language like Filipino would affect that. It would be the reason for that. And so I found, yes, uh, that uh, in experimental studies that we conducted uh, in a picture description class, for example, they tend to transfer their L1 grammatical properties of the nominative accusative marking to ergative. So there were errors, many errors, glaring errors, significant number of errors, like kinain ako ang manga. Okay? And I thought before I did the study, I thought that it was just uh, something unique to maybe me or maybe my family or maybe a small community, but then I realized it's widespread. So I, the, the study really gave uh, uh, what a, an empirical evidence to the phenomenon of negative transfer. And it does not have to do anything about Chabacano speakers having difficulty with Tagalog because it's such a, a foreign language, but it has got to do with the internal language structure of Chabacano that gets in the way in second language acquisition. So in short, the answer to the question is, it is accusative in typology. Thank you very much for explaining all that, Dr. <laughs> Arnuka. <laughs> uh, Dr. Arnuka and Dr. Rodriguez apparently uh, went to the same high school. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez also is from Zamboanga and speaks Chabacan. Uh, if, if anyone in the room, in the Zoom room, has uh, any questions for um, Dr. Arnuko and Dr. Pilai, uh, feel free to raise your hands and ask your questions. We, uh, in the meantime, we have a, a less technical question here for Dr. Arnuko. What do the features of Chabacano say about the people that use it or the culture within which it's used? Um, Chabacano as uh, presented in many different works, including the one that I did this afternoon, show that it is influenced by many Philippine languages, particularly Cebuano, because uh, at the turn of the 20th century, a lot of Visayan speakers came to Sambuanga, and that's documented, and Rubino even said that uh, the pronominal system, the plural pronominal system of Chabacano is largely influenced by Cebuano. Like Kanaton, the Amon, Amon, Aton, these are uh, Cebuano pronouns. So it's really a, a mixed uh, uh, quality, as I mentioned in the thesis of the presentation. And that also reflects the mestizo quality that uh, Ruescas Ruescas, uh, Javier Ruescas mentioned at the start of the, the panel, I mean the, the conference, this particular 
uh, leg of the conference. Uh, it shows very much that Chabacano speakers are not uh, isolated, unique people, but they are very much part of the Philippine, Philippine culture. It's just that it is also highly an, a trace of Spanish and Portuguese, the Iberian influences. And it's not just in the words that we use, because certainly if you listen to us, if you listen, and, and so many here, by the way, are speakers of Chabacano, native speakers of Chabacano. There are so many uh, vocabulary, a lot, of, a lot of words are derived from Spanish and Portuguese. That's understandable because as a Creole, the lexifier language is uh, Spanish. Okay, so we have a lot of words that are Spanish derived. And most of these are words that have to do with the home, with the, with the person, like uh, parts of the body, very intimate, uh, you know, the personal uh, uh, domain, okay? Uh, days of the week, time signals, months, uh, the calendar, uh, religious festivities. So notably, the lexicon is Spanish derived, but the grammar is very much influenced by, by the languages with which Chabacano is in constant use. So as I showed, the, the BSO order, for example, which is the unmarked order for uh, Austronesian languages, is the order that Chabacano uses. And that's also in, in Jojo's presentation, of Jojo's presentation, that the most common pattern is the BSO pattern. Start with the verb and then the subject and the object, like takaminayo, uh, uh, I am walking, or takumbersayo, ta, the aspectual marker, conversa, speak, and then yo, the subject. So there, it is a reflection of the BSO uh, word order, which is a uh, Philippine type verb initial uh, word order for Austronesian languages. But also in terms of vocabulary, we've got a lot from uh, words that are derived from Spanish. All right, thank you. And uh, Dr. Noel, uh, I think has a follow-up question uh, regarding uh, Chabacano as a lingua franca. Dr. Noel Rodriguez. So uh, there is a question uh, with regards to um, uh, Chabacano and Cristang as well for being a, a lingua franca, but is it also a literary language now, in the present times? Or a language for intellectual exchange? Yeah, I, I think um, there are people, there are linguists also here in the Zoom room. Uh, like uh, Dr. Rob de los Reyes and uh, Mark uh, Francis Francisco, who are also uh, speakers and who also, uh, well, uh, Dr. Rob de los Reyes, I think is a linguist and has translated the uh, little prince to Chavacano. Mm -hmm. So if they want to answer Hi, that question. <laughs> Hi, Rob. Are you here, Rob? <laughs> Rob and uh, Mark, yeah asked to unmute. And actually, because uh, Mark also uh, works in the uh, uh, city hall right now, uh, the government, and, and they do publications of um, a number of publications on poetry, on literature. So I've seen, so there's an initiative from the, from the government as well. So Irene, I don't know if uh, this has helped for example, with the proliferation of the language because it's widely spoken, as opposed to, for example, the other parts of uh, the Philippines where uh, the Creole language has not been used and, or is actually extinct. Or for example, with Kristang, um, does the government policy come into play as well? Should I go first, <laughs> Irene? Um, yeah, um, well, the, our language policies, I mean, they don't disallow any language from being used, but there is no provision for um, 
how do I say this um, before, without getting to trouble? Well, I mean, the focus <laughs> the focus is obviously on the majority language, the national language, Malay, Basque Malay, and uh, on English. And uh, the other two major languages will be Mandarin and Tamil, for which, uh, in terms of Kristang, because it's mainly a spoken language and language used in uh, verbal, you know, poetry. Um, Margaret Sarkisian mentioned Mata Kantika, for example, in the past. So there is there wasn't really literature that was passed on, you know, literature that we can we can find. So that's why we've been attempting to um, to write things down, and that's why we came up with the with the trilingual uh, children's book of a of of a popular um, kind of kind of folk song, popular in Indonesia, popular in Kristang and Malay, uh, Nina Boboy. And we did it. We we deliberately did it trilingually because we wanted to, because the children would know Malay, would know English, and then from there they can then make out what the Kristang was. Uh, and we have huge problems because everybody just spells it differently, and you know, um, <laughs> and so it's really hard to standardize it without having a proper like a board to standardize it and. Well, do you want to standardize it? Is the other the other issue? So we've been trying to come up with reading materials, but and also we have an app, a dictionary app, English English Christian Christian English. But we also give alternative spellings because we realize that people will spell differently. And by the way, when we were coming up with the spelling, we realized that uh, there were a lot of identity issues there too, like why can't we spell it this way because we want to reflect our Portuguese ancestry um, but then again we know about Portuguese spelling being quite notoriously difficult um, yeah so there's actually issues even with spelling surprise surprise um, yeah so um, so we we are trying to put it down on print so that we can pass things on it's not been it's not been as easy as we thought but there's new platforms though where people are, are using it in a written quasi written form uh, social media, social media and WhatsApp texts and um, but again, there's no standardization of spelling. So I'm sure Chabacano is far, far uh, has has far more materials written down than we do because we don't have provisions. So we do depend on um, community funding, you know, community engagement funding, like from the universities um, or private funding if we want to publish things. Yeah, I'd love to read that children's book. Uh, we're actually, you, Jackie. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. We're actually celebrating. Uh, we just celebrated last Tuesday, National Children's Book Day here in the Philippines. We celebrate it every third Tuesday of July. So maybe we can even have that book translated to Filipino. Right? Yeah, that would thank be you. Nice. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Delay. Um, we also actually wanted to ask uh, Dr. Sipola, uh, who's not here with us, uh, what led her to study um, Chabacano communities, a Finnish woman studying Chabacano communities, uh, particularly in Cavite and Ternate. But um, unfortunately, she's not here to answer that. Um, but I have here a couple more questions. Um, one is uh, actually for uh, Dr. Yap Aizon, um, uh, in his paper, he talked about uh, how Zamboanga Chabacano should also be looked at as a, not as, as a bastardized Spanish language because it has its own grammar rules of its own. So the question is how prevalent is this perception uh, and uh, why does it continue to persist if it does and what are the implications uh, for the language and its users. So I maybe Dr. Arnuko can answer yeah. that. <clears throat> yeah, Doc Jojo uh, started with that notion that uh, Chabacano is uh, bastardized Spanish. And I must say that before I did my graduate school, I used to have that notion as well, uh, being part of the community, being part of the outside community, looking into inside, but then I, I realized as I was studying, uh, taking courses of the, uh, of the language, not necessarily the language, but languages in general, Philippine languages, I realized that no, uh, the reason why um, that notion is prevalent is because we often look up to, we often look at one yardstick for grammar and that is Spanish, but we forget that it's a Creole 
and a creole is a a product of uh, contact right it is a product over time and it's very complex imagine a, a group of Like, oh, there are no plays breaking up a little. Uh, I think uh, she's, uh, she warned us about this, that yes, she might get yes. frozen every now and then. Uh, yeah. Before we go and continue with her um, comment, um, oh no, she has left. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so maybe yeah, a little mm -hmm. um, parallelism between um, Kristang and uh, Samwangenyo, I think. Because um, with uh, Samwanga history, with the language, so from 1719, when the, the fort was re-established again, then the community um, would, would continue to grow from there. But with Kristang and with the Portuguese community, you have them uh, setting up in 1511. But after that, 1641, uh, the, Portuguese, uh, the, the, the Dutch come and actually even ban uh, there was a point anyway where, where it was banned, not, not all throughout, but um, in, in different segments. Then from 1641, the English come, and then the Dutch come, then the English come again. So the Portuguese is actually gone, and yet Kristang as a community continues. I mean, um, maybe you want to add to that, Stephanie, the historical background and that how amazing it is that yeah. the, the community continues to thrive even you know, with all these uh, centuries, actually, right, of um, of banning and of uh, other um, col colonials coming into the picture. Yeah, I think it's a it's a real surprise that you know it's it's practically the last surviving uh, Asian uh, Portuguese Creole uh, in or uh, Southeast Asian anyway. Um, particularly when the Dutch came, and it wasn't it wasn't you know it, you even. Catholicism was not allowed to be practiced, so it kind of went underground. And there are some legacies of that, of, of how people were still fighting to, to use it. And probably that's one of the key factors that religion, family was strong. And so even when they had they were brought to um, Indonesia or, to, or they went to Macau, um, you can see traces of Kristang there, right? I mean, you, if you listen to to what's left of songs now now in Tugu is just songs and uh, they don't speak it anymore but in Ma in Macau you can in Patui you can hear the Kristang in there so obviously people were still speaking it and uh, still using it um, and what happened was I think in be because the family unit and because of of religion that was probably that were probably like the two important reasons that kept the language going even when the british came and english became more sort of prestigious and important and it's still that 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 notion still persists till today um that keeping of that village the setting up of the village was really really important really important um, because everything outside the village started to become different. And um, even with the language going, or, or I think there's a, as I mentioned, there's a resurgence as people are claiming their identity as young people, young Malaysians. There's a lot of things that you need to understand about our politics, about our social uh, kind of whatever's going on now. Uh, people are clinging on to something, and that something is your identity. And language does play a part. So even if you do not know people like me who didn't grow up speaking that the language, um, we we want to learn bits of it. We want to learn even if we get to know the food items, even if we get to know some of the swear words. You know, um, it's it's reclaiming. You know, I think Margaret really really knocked it, uh, got it, got it right when she said that. We are reclaiming, and, and we can see that among the young people, they're reclaiming that Kristang identity. Um, so the history has been quite, um, it's, it's been in waves, hasn't it? Uh, like the silly pandemic that we have now. Uh, so Kristang has gone through that, but it's not just the language, it's the, it's the religion, it's the whole cultural practices, because um, up to, well, it's been a year since we haven't had any of the festivals, but the village, has been like the, it's it's been like the nucleus in a sense, right? It's been the drawing point for the festival of San Pedro, for example. It's where Christmas 
is a big thing. Easter is a big thing. Um, and the water festival that that uh, precedes Lent, you know, those things, um, many Malaysians don't even know about it. But that's where people go back there. And that's where you kind of uh, celebrate each other. You hear the language being spoken. You, you feel different. You feel part of the community. Um, and it's sad that the pandemic has kind of put a damper on that. So hopefully we've survived the Dutch <laughs> and, and the English, we will survive the pandemic as well. So yeah, so the history, yeah, history does play. I think it's a whole ecology, right, Noel? It's, it's everything. It's not just the history, but it's the politics. It's how we have been othered, you know, in, uh, by, the, by the state, uh, being a minority community, but also how we are reclaiming and reconstructing our identity through food, I think that's very important through some of the number one yes number one definitely we talk about food while we're having having a one meal we talk about the next meal okay um and we love that sense of togetherness and family and that's what keeps us going i think yeah and i think we have to mention because this is also i mean uh being sponsored by the ateneo de manila university which is a jesuit university ah. how big um very big yes <laughs> for us uh the fact that saint francis savior was in malacca yes. there's actually a saint francis savior walk <laughs> yes and malacca. tours uh, <laughs> by dr uh, by uh, colin go for example yes. <laughs> one of those will give us a, a tour of malacca with yes. uh, the, the, the steps of saint francis yes. Savior. yes yes we had both the portuguese and the french catholic um you know, influence. And uh, it's interesting, even if you go to the cemetery, and again, Colin is the best person uh, to, to take you on this tour, and you can see the influence between by the two, two Catholic uh, countries, you know, that in, in Malacca and, and in the whole, the whole Portuguese makeup, really, of, of Portuguese Malaysian uh, makeup. Yeah. And Dr. Arnuko is uh, with uh, uh, De La Salle University, and there is a De La Salle, University, uh, a college, I think, in in uh, Malacca, uh, and it is called uh, Savior School. Oh, St. Xavier School, yeah, yeah. There yeah. are the La Salle That's schools, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have La Salle schools uh, in in Malaysia. The yeah, in Kuala Lumpur, in Petaling Jaya, yes. Run by the La Salle brothers, right? All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have here um, a couple more questions. Um, one is from Robin de los Reyes. Robin, if you're here, um, you may want to ask it yourself. Uh, but if, uh, if you're not able to, uh, let me know so I can read it for you. Hi. Hi, so Robin. I'll just, yeah, I'll just uh, switch off my video so I could save. Uh, sure. Yeah, so actually it's more of a comment because uh, I fear I feel that um, language policies uh, would play a big role in terms of the preservation of uh, uh, Creole languages such as Chabacano and Cristang. You know? So we're just thankful in the city because Chabacano is identified as one of those 19 languages to be taught. You know? so, uh, so now it will be uh, further, you know, uh, developed mm -hmm. and eventually we will have, uh, hopefully we'll have more of a standardized um, form of, of, of the language so we could use them in writing. So I have to say that because, for example, the, uh, Dr. Noel mentioned earlier about translating the little prince and um, there are actually two versions of the translation. There's another guy who translated it. And I just noticed that our translations vary so much. So uh, even though we both uh, you know, are speakers of the language. So uh, yeah, so that's an interesting uh, development here. No? So, and, and we'll see like um, where this is going in terms of, and I don't know if it's also a good idea to have a standardized form because that in a way would, you know, like, um, I don't know. And the other thing that I'm um, concerned, uh, not concerned, but I'm looking at how we can further um, maintain the language by allowing features of other languages to be adapt, uh, you know, to be allowed to, to be used you know, with, with the Chabacana language. So I, for one, for example, is a proponent of translanguaging. You know? So I don't know how, 
people, for example, uh, in, in in Malaysia, like the the speakers of Kristang, would take uh, that, you know, as um as a way also to preserve their language. You know? So keeping it dynamic by allowing features of other languages, even English, uh, you know, so that language will continue to survive. Yeah, that that would be all. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, would our speakers like to comment on that? Either uh, Dr. Pillai or Dr. Anuko? Yeah, I'd like to, to res well, not respond, but also comment. Yeah, that's really true. Um, we, we all know it's a, it's a, we can't control uh, the mixing of languages. Uh, where from one end, there's the, 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 the pure, the purest uh, tradition, okay, the purest view of language. But on the other hand, uh, language is in constant use with other languages. And we are a highly multilingual community in the Philippines. We have over a hundred languages. And within Sambuanga City, within the region, we have several, as we saw in the pre in the earlier presentations, so many languages uh, all together being used along with, uh, with uh, the more dominant ones like English and of course the official language Filipino. So we can't help, uh, we can't help it that, uh, that in the classroom, for example, as Robin found in his uh, study and Monhe et al as well, there really is translanguaging going on. Uh, translanguaging happens not only among kids, but also among teachers who are supposed to implement the mother tongue based multilingual education. And yet, even if there is a clear MT that's uh, uh, required, prescribed by the ed, what actually happens in the classroom is that there is a mix of languages going on. And for what reason? It's for a pedagogical function. It, had, it helps, uh, excuse me, uh, teachers and students understand the lesson better. So I, for one, uh, for as long as there is a uh, reason to it and it helps people communicate, it helps people express what they feel, I, I'm okay with that. Uh, although, of course, the other side of it, the, the purist's point of view might oppose that, of course. No? But um, we are lucky in Sumbuanga because uh, Chabacano is uh, clearly sustained. It is uh, institutionalized. There's literature, entertainment, masses are held uh, regularly. Uh, media also uses it, okay? But in the case of the two other surviving forms like Ternate and Cavite, Cavite Chabacano, Ternateño, the numbers have really dwindled. And it's also because of their proximity to Manila, Filipino, Tagalog being the dominant language and a lot of people uh, work there, study there. Uh, I mean, most areas around Cavite, these are Tagalog speakers already, dominated by Tagalog speakers. So that's also one of the uh, ecological factors that uh, account or, or, or uh, explain why the numbers have dwindled in these areas. But for Chabacano, Sambuangueño Chabacano in Sambuanga City, we're lucky and we hope that um, we would have more programs in place. The MTBMLA is uh, a right step in that direction, okay? Because it helps document the language. It helps uh, use the language even among, especially among younger generations. So it's just a comment on that. Thank you. May, may Thank I you. add to, to that? Um, this is coming from uh, Mark uh, Francisco, who uh, who works at the city government of uh, Sambuanga. He says, um, the city started its programs in 2014 or maybe earlier, I'm not sure, but uh, this is from him. And the idea from the mayor, current mayor, uh, Ben Klimako. So we started with the orthography, then dictionary, then storybooks in Chavacano. And all of these are being distributed for free to the different schools. And there is also the sponsored, um, it's sponsored by the local government of Sambuanga. And uh, it is also used for 
uh, the mother tongue classes for grades one to three. So I, I think Irene, you, you studied that as well, right? The use of the mother tongue and Chavacano is a, a mother tongue that is used and it is a, a language that is used for the, the schools themselves from grades one to three. So that is from uh, Mark uh, Francisco. Or I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Um, if there are no other questions from this Zoom room, uh, I would like to end our Q&A with a question from uh, the Dean of the School of Humanities, Dr. Jonathan Chua. He asks, when does a Creole cease to be labeled as such and get treated simply as a language? If I just may respond, I think that's been a lot of, um, from the post-call point of view, it's like, why are we even using the word Creole? Mm -hmm. uh, I have personally also, I have actually dropped it and I just say Malacca Portuguese, uh, despite the fact that, you know, a certain, the old boys club seem to oppose the use of that and they want the Creole there. And they, so I think, again, it's about claiming and it's about um, because because Creole tends to ha still have a very negative uh, pers perspective from especially from a layman's point of view. Yeah, I'm all for dropping it. So I think it's not a matter of like it's a natural progression. It is it is about us claiming it just as how we we you know in terms of like varieties of English, for example, how we we say yeah, it's it's just a variety. It's not a, it's not a bad bad thing to have Filipino English or Malaysian English or, yeah. So I think it will cease when we cease and I've stopped using Creole, which may not get me published, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that very honest answer. <laughs> and uh, that wraps up our Q&A this afternoon. Uh, again, we'd like to thank our presenters for uh, sharing with us uh, their research. And um, I, before we end, I'd like to call on uh, the chair of the Department of English, Dr. Priscilla Dancruz. Hi, everyone. I was really excited for this event, mainly because I get to hear my good friend, Stephanie, who I last saw a few years ago at the Free Linguistics Conference and my other good friend, Irene, from La Salle, and we worked together. And it was a really nice surprise to see my other good friend, Robin De Los Reyes. <laughs> so, hi, hi, everyone. I'm glad you came, and I'm glad you participated in this conference. Actually, I found the conversation to be very stimulating. It's, as someone who also studies language, it's wonderful to see how the stories of our histories and our communities are expressed in the, in the way we language in our languaging. And language is not just the words and the grammar that we know, but it's multimodal. So it's food, it's our clothes, it's, it's everything, honestly. And because I'm a language person, I like to think that language is at least 95% of everything. And it's wonderful we had this panel. So thank you to Nikki and to Jonathan for giving us this chance because it looks at how important languaging is. And I think Stephanie and Irene and Robin and the other linguists here will know why I use language as a verb. Okay, so I'm, I'm glad that we were able to have this little panel. Um, it puts the spotlight on the importance of language and the importance of identity. And I myself, I'm really fascinated in questions regarding Chavacano because it is a fascinating language and one of our many languages. And um, to answer our Dean's question, Jonathan, I think I'd have to agree with Stephanie. We just shouldn't use the word Creole anymore because a language is a language and all languages do what they're supposed to do. That is, they signal our identities and they bind us into communities. So thank you all for coming to this part of the conference. I know Nikki told me we were the last 
and I'm really honored we actually have this position. Thank you very much. And yep, happy to welcome you to the English department. And I'm looking forward to hopefully working with all of you some more in the future. Thank you very much, Rixie. And we also have some announcements from Nikki. You're on mute. Thank you, Prixie, for closing the panel. But you're, we're not just closing the panel, we're closing conference part four on legacies of the encounter in forms of expression. It's the longest of the four because the School of Humanities um, sponsored the event. And so this area is really closest to the heart of the School of Humanities. We started on Wednesday last week with um, Javier Ruescas's keynote. And we had our first panel on Wednesday on architecture and built structures, followed by a panel on Thursday with flows of art. Sorry, that's my kid. Artifacts and art styles. And then on Thursday, we had a panel on literature. I'm sorry, on Friday, we had a panel on literature. And on Saturday, we're tracing the footsteps of Rizal in Madrid, um, a special panel. We rested on Sunday, because even God rests on Sunday, but on Monday we made up for it with two panels. One in the morning sponsored by the Wawaranang Filipino, and when the Filipino department sponsors, they really speak in Filipino even for an international conference. I apologize, we were code switching because we were so relaxed uh, and enjoying that panel, forgetting what language we were speaking in. And at that evening, another panel on cultural flows and reinventions, a musical one, which was also very enjoyable. We went over time um, last night in the panel on fashion. And to be honest, Noel Rodriguez even stayed until 11 p.m. in the Zoom room, even after we've ended the live stream. And today's panel language uh, is the great finale. It's a form of expression, not just verbal expression, but an expression of identity. And this is not even the end. <laughs> because, um, oh, sorry, I forgot. I also have to thank the community that came together, you know, the Department of Fine Arts, Interdisciplinary Studies, Modern Languages, Department of English, Department of Filipino, Department of History, all under the main organizing power of the Dean of the School of Humanities, Dean Jonathan Chua. And then we work with the Philippine Embassy in Spain, and of course, Sham Centro de Humanidades Universidad in Nova de Lisboa, um, and the National Quincentennial Committee of the Philippines. The organizing committee is composed of Jonathan Chua, Paulo Pinto, Francis Navarro, Feliz Noel Rodriguez, and myself. And it was Robbie Reyes who helped set up our website and all our Google Forms and all the beautiful posters that you've seen throughout the five weeks that was designed by Tracy Monson. To get the Zoom room running, thank you, Chris Castillo, team leaders Vince, Cosmiano, Albert Santos, Jack Torontegui, and for the Facebook live stream, thank you, National Quincentennial Committee Secretariat, Ian Alfonso, Ruben Nieves, Joseph Villa, and Jonel Rabusa. God knows we experienced a lot of things in this 500-year journey in five weeks. There is a book sale for five days and it started on July 21 and it will end on July 25 and the books that were published by speakers and organizers of this event are on sale at 30% off. You can get some ebooks or some print materials. You can just get them on Shopee and on Lazada and tomorrow. The grand finale. <laughs> the final, final goodbye truly end tomorrow. Will Professor Ambet Ocampo, our very own from Ateneo, will be delivering his closing keynote, rewind, fast forward, record, delete, liberating ourselves from the past five years, so oh, 500 years. So after talking about contact and continuities, he had to come up with a title like this. We'll see you all tomorrow at 4 p.m. again. Back to you, Jackie. Thank you very much, Nikki, and congratulations to you and your team for this amazing feat, uh, this month-long uh, international online conference. Um, and thank you also to our speakers for today and to our viewers for staying with us. And on behalf of today's host, 
uh, my home department, the English department, and the conference organizers, namely the School of Humanities of the Ateneo de Manila University, our partners, CHAM, Centro de Humanidades, Universidad de Nova de Lisboa, and the National Quincentennial Community. Enjoy the rest of your evening and stay safe.